Good morning, everyone. Good to have you joining us this morning. Good to have people joining us online as well. Glad you're present with us. A couple of announcements. Uh, in two, the week after Easter, I'm not sure, that might be three weeks from now, uh, on April 7th, we have Bricktastic Bash. And uh, that's for preschool through fifth grade and their families. They're going to play with Lego blocks and uh, Lego movie and uh, Barry Singh so they can sign up for that event. So that's going to be great. It will be great. This week, uh, the cafe is going to be closed. The after school and Rockus will be canceled for this week. Dan, Dan Bailey's on vacation. And also want to let you know Betty Atkinson died uh, this week on Wednesday on March 13th. And they're going to have services sometime in the spring, they're going to scatter their ashes in the, on the farm. And uh, never had a service for her husband either, and uh, that'll happen at both times, uh, both together uh, sometime in the spring. So we extend our sympathies to that family. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beauty of the week, uh, for the, the spring light weather which we enjoyed, the daffodils are coming up and signs of life are springing forth all around us. We thank you for that. But more than that, we thank you for the life that we have in Jesus Christ. And we, we just ask that you would draw us near unto yourself as Savior, Lord, and God. And uh, we do extend, uh, ask that you would just minister to the family of Betty and comfort them and those who grieve her loss. And we thank you again for your love in Jesus and ask your anointing this time of worship. In your name we pray, amen. Let's uh, stand and say hello to the person nearest, please, as we prepare to worship the Lord. We're going to sing hymn number 101, My Jesus, I Love Thee. 101, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Let's confess our sins using the confession that's on the screen. Lord Jesus, we address you this morning as the great physician. Heal our souls, for we have sinned. Heal our minds, for we have made wrong choices. Heal our conscience, for our values have been compromised. 
Heal our hearts, for we have done right things for wrong reasons. Amen. Lord, we do pray to you as the great physician, and we ask that you would just that you would do just as we asked a moment ago, that you would heal our hearts, heal our lives, shape us, mold us after your will. Each and every one of us. This is a corporate confession. We're all saying it in unison. We're reading it off the screen, and it can seem impersonal. We're not being very specific. But if we took the time and reflected, every one of us knows shortcomings of our life, even this past week, we pray that you would cleanse us and help us to be different, help us to be different in a relationship with, with you as we honor you in all ways in our relationship with other people. Sometimes we, we treat them in a way that would be different, speak to them in a way that would be contrasting with the way your son, the Lord Jesus, interacted with people. Help us to be shaped after Jesus each and every day. And thank you for your faithful and forgiving love. We just appreciate your love so much and your forgiveness. In your name we pray, amen. Please be seated. I want to look at the scripture lesson this morning. And the scripture is found, from the ninth, found in the 19th chapter of Matthew. And uh, I'm going to begin by reading in the 16th verse. Listen to the word of God. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what deed must they have to do to inherit eternal life, to have eternal life? That's a question people would probably ask, right? There's people in our society today that would want to know that. Jesus responded. He said, why ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. But, if, but to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man asked. Jesus replied, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely or lie. You must honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I have to do? Must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and then you'll have treasure in heaven then come and follow me but when the young man heard this he went away for he had many possessions then Jesus said to his disciples I tell you the truth it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven I say it again it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then when, who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. With God, everything is possible. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new, and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne. You who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has, been, who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now, will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. This ends a reading of God's holy word. Seated. 
We show a short video clip of a father uh, trying to get his little girl's attention, the child's attention, and uh, her affection. Here it is. Isn't that good? Poor dad, though, right? Poor father. Can't win, a, can't win the approval of his child at all. Sometimes that happens. Uh, but uh, he's a good father. He did what it took, right? He did whatever it took to get the love of his child. I'm not sure a girl boy. Um, I'm going to talk about him in a minute, but not first. At first, I want to talk about poker. Anybody here like to play poker? <laughs> Well, I got a poker game set up here. I, I, I play poker. I played poker. I just never for money. Uh, never for money. A couple of reasons. Uh, one, gee, I've seen people have their lives destroyed by gambling. I really have. And two, I'm too cheap. I would never do them like that. But in this game, in this sermon, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a game of poker. I have it set up up here. And uh, so these are the the white chips are worth one and. Red are five and the blue are ten. So, can you imagine now if some of you might play and say, well, this is a dime and this is 50 cents or this is a dollar or this is a penny and this is five or... Well, let's pretend that this is one dollar or, or uh, ten dollars. No, one dollar and then five and ten. But let's go further than that. Let's pretend it's not one, five, and ten. Let's pretend it's ten. Is that fifty? <laughs> oh man! And this is a hundred. This is—I can't fathom it. Like I'm, this is too much. But let's go further. Let's pretend that this is one hundred. This is five hundred. And this is a thousand. Anybody want to play? Like just the thought of this makes me want to run to the bathroom. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine playing a game like this. I couldn't imagine. So let's pretend, but somehow for some reason, I don't know why, I, I'm playing this game. And uh, so we, I know that poker has different variations and all that kind of thing. And uh, We've gone through all that. We're down to the last, the last bid here. We're in the last bid. And you know, you know what I'm sitting with here? I have a full house eights high. Nothing wild, full house eights wide, high. Whoops. Now, how much do you think? Now they saw my four. Great, I got eights and fours. How much do you think I should bid? Remember, uh, 100, 500, 1,000, how much should I bid on? Full house, eights high. You know, how you know how much I'm going to bid? 
zero. I'm not bidding a thing. I don't care how good the hand is. I could have a royal flush. I'm not bidding. I, it's like, this is way too much. But let's say that I have to bid. Okay, I, I got to participate. Somehow, the, the rules of the game is I, I, I got to get into it. I, I have to play this game and I have to play to win. What am I going to bid? Well, I'll get back to that. Now I'm gonna have another interruption. I'm gonna get back to the father with the mustache. I'm gonna get back to the poker game. But before I get to the father and the poker game, I wanna talk about the story I read a moment ago. So what happened in the story? A rich man who could play this poker game, okay? The rich man who could have gotten in on this game without batting an eye, that rich man, that rich man one time came to Jesus with a question. What was his question? He said, and he had, a, he had his checkbook open at the time. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, what do, I, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? That was his question. What, what do I have to do? What's the, what hoops do I have to jump through to, to get in? That's what he wanted to know. And Jesus said this. He said, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. In other words, you've got to be good. You want to get in? Obey the commandments. Be good, and you're, you're going to be okay. The guy said, which commandments? Which commandments do I have to obey? Can you, can you tell me which commandments you're talking about here? And Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must honor your father and mother, and you must love your neighbors yourself. And the guy is listening to this. And, and the guy was rich, we know that, but he was also a good man. So he's listening to Jesus, and Jesus says, you must not murder. He says, I've never murdered anybody. And you must not commit adultery. And the guy says, I've been faithful to my wife. Never. Never did, because he's young. Never did yet, but he will not. He's committed. Nope, never. Haven't done it, won't. You must not steal. Now, he's rich. He could be ripping people off, but he didn't. He was pure. He was a good, fair businessman. He was good. He did not rip people off. He did not steal. He must not testify falsely. He must not testify falsely. He must not lie. And he says to himself, I, I haven't lied. My Aunt Merle's 95th birthday party was yesterday. There's where you lie. <laughs> There's where you lie. Yeah, you pull the white lie. Okay, with that exception, he says. I, I lied about my Aunt Merle's birthday party. It was a surprise. It's always a risk to have a surprise birthday party for a 95-year-old woman, but we'll just leave it at that. But he says, other than his Aunt Merle's birthday party at 95, he didn't lie. Didn't lie. So he's got, he didn't lie, and, and he honored his parents. Honored his parents, and love your neighbors yourself. I, I try to pe pe treat people fairly, and I, I'm generous with other people. So Jesus says, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't uh, honor your parents and care for neighbors like you care for yourself. And he said, check, 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 done them all. So we got, we got, and he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. I mean, nobody's perfect, but he's really largely telling the truth. truth. So what do you know about this guy? Guy is rich enough to play at this table, one, and He's good. He's rich and good. Then Jesus says, he says, what else? Anything else? And Jesus says, well, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And he dropped his head, first his mouth, dropped his head and walked slowly away. And the disciples, the scripture says, the disciples were astounded then who in the world can be saved? Like, if this guy's not making it, who else can make it? Who can? Like, this guy is rich, and he's good. Now, when we associate rich, we might be cynical about the person and how they acquired their riches. They might rip people off and that kind of thing. But back, here's, you got to crawl inside the heads of the disciples. The heads of the disciples said, if you're rich, you're rich because you were blessed by God. You're not rich just by coincidence. God blessed you. Your riches are evidence that God has blessed you. So you're a rich, having been blessed by God, 
And this guy, in this case, he was rich, so we know he's blessed by God, and he's good. He's rich, and he's good. And the disciples, he walks away, he's not going to make it. And the disciples are like, whoa, if this rich guy, who's also good, is not going to make it, what chance do we have? And, and, and then Jesus makes this statement to, to make it even tougher. He says to the disciples, I tell you the truth. It's very, very hard, very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. What are we going to do? I say it again. It's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of, of God, is what he says. It's like, he's rich and he's good. And they're like, what? He's rich and he's good. He's not getting in. Now, let's not get confused by the eye of the needle thing. You probably know. Maybe you don't. But you have a fence to keep the camels in or the camels out or whatever. And in the fence, like the joint between the posts, of the, fe- the, the rails of the fence is a post. They called that the needle. And there was an opening in the needle. And it was possible this space between the fence somehow and the, the, the post was called the eye of the needle. And Every now and then, an agile camel or a smaller camel would get out, just like farmers would tell you, I have all the fencing, and yet sometimes the cows get out, and sometimes the camels would get through. So Jesus isn't saying a rich person is never going to make it, but he is saying it doesn't happen very often. And the disciples are thinking, man, this is, this is tough to process here, because this guy is rich, he's blessed by God, and he's good, rich and good, where does that leave us? Because they're making a comparison to the guy. See, I've, I've always thought this story is a story about the rich man. It is about the rich man, but I think it's really even more so about the disciples and them figuring things out. And here's what the point of the story is for the disciples. They're making a comparison of themselves to the rich man. And all they know is this rich man, who's also good, isn't going to make it. Where does that leave us? Have you ever made comparisons with other people? Anybody? We all have, right? We all have made comparisons. Like, you might compare yourself when you were in school. Oh, this group of kids or this individual is really smart. I'll never be as smart as that. And they're better. They simply are better than you. They're smarter than you. They really are. Or this person over here is more athletic than you. And they really are more athletic. Or this person is more handy with their hands. Or this person is more musical. Or this person is more outgoing. And I'm shy and reserved. Or this. We all make comparisons. And in this story, that's what the disciples are doing. They're making a comparison between the rich man, the rich good man, and themselves. And they're saying, we, we, don't, we don't measure up. Now, in the area of financing, finances, if you get behind in this bill and this bill and this bill, and you have this person calling you for money and this person and credit bill collectors and all this stuff hounding you and pressing in on you and your landlord or whatever is saying, pay up or I'm going to evict, that kind of thing. If you get it going again and again and again, at some point, what might you consider doing to get out of that mess, you decide one day you might just have to declare what? See, the disciples were at that point thinking, like, if this guy is rich and this guy is good, by comparison, if he's not making it by comparison, we might, in fact, be not financially bankrupt, but spiritually bankrupt. Like, we're never going to make it. I can't play catch up here. Has that ever happened to you where you've ever in your life, maybe it's not right now, but ever in your life made comparisons to other people and said, whoa, this person is so good, but me by comparison. And then you evaluate, don't understand how salvation comes and you just make an evaluation and you say, Phew. I'm never going to catch up. Or maybe you're in this room or in one of the other services. Maybe you're listening online. Or maybe you're at the Journey Cafe listening to me and saying, I see all these other people, and they got their act together, and I don't. How am I ever ever going to catch up? 
That, that's, that's the question. Like, how, how am I going to catch up? I'm not, I'm not measuring up. How do I catch up? I, I'm just not going to make it. Let, let me get back to the poker game now, okay? Back to the poker game. So I'm sitting with the full house. What's high? Ah, eight's high, yeah. And, I, and the chips, or do you remember the chips? So I'll never forget the price of the chips. It's a, a hundred and a five hundred and thousand. I'm just... Again, not comfortable with that, but it is what it is. And uh, if I relate the poker game to what Jesus is saying to the rich man, what does Jesus want the rich man to do? That's right. All in. Do you see that? He wants the rich man to go all in. He doesn't want him to hold back. Now watch this. Listen to the scripture. I'll jump back to the scripture. He says in the scripture, the guy says, I've done all these good things. He says, "Sell." here's what I want you to do now. Sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And normally or often when we read the scripture, we focus in on the money and we think, ooh, all in means, or, or we look at the story and we say, ooh, that means that if Jesus expected this guy to give all his money to God, then we have to give all our money to God. And I would suggest this isn't just about money. This is about everything. He, he doesn't just want us to give all of our money to him. The bigger point is he wants us to give our lives to him. Everything. Now, we get to retain money and live life. That's not the point. But he wants us, really, just like in the poker game, he wants, he's calling for the rich man to go all in. The rich man is not willing to go all in. It's not a story about the rich man giving his money. It's much bigger than that. He wants him to go all in. What's he saying? He's saying, you've got to go all in. And often, rich people can't go all in. That's what he's saying. And he wants the same with the disciples. He wants, them, he wants the disciples to go all in. And if you listen to the scripture, again, listen to it again. It says, sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then what? Then come and what? Follow me. Like whatever I do, whatever I tell you to do. If I say jump, you say how high. I mean, God wants us to be all in, in life. Let me get back to the, the father with the mustache. How long did he have that mustache? How long? You know what? When he started getting peach fuzz, he never cut it. Did you see the one point in the video where he held a picture up? Did you see that? Who was that? That was his grandfather. See, that was his grandfather who had a mustache, and I'm sure his father had a mustache, and this guy had a mustache. We've always had mustache, mustaches in our families. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is part of my identity. This is a big deal to me. And yet, he's confronted by this child who's scared of him with the mustache. And he's got to decide, what am I willing to do to show love to my granddaughter, to my daughter? What am, I gonna, what am I willing to do? And what does he do at the end of the video clip? He cuts it off, and what's he doing, essentially? He's going all in as a father. He is saying, there is nothing that I won't do for my daughter. Is it easy to go all in? No, that's why the video was two minutes long. He's like trying to, he had the mask at one point, trying to be cute, and then pulls his face out. You know, he's trying, and then finally he realizes, no, what is required of me as a father in this situation is to go all in, shave the mustache, and if that's what I'm required to do, then that's what I'm going to do. Jesus asked the same thing of his followers and of, uh, of us. He wants us to go all in. Now, the disciples, they're looking at this guy. Holy crow. He is rich. And he's good, and he ain't making it. Where does that leave us? And they were, do you remember the word? They were astounded. Like this was, this was an earthquake for them spiritually. Like, where do we stand in this? It's what they're thinking. And Jesus knows they're thinking that. He knows that they've been rattled by this. And so right after this scripture, it's very interesting, right after this, this event happens where the guy comes up and Jesus, he walks off, right after that, do you know what Jesus did next? He told them a story. He always tells them stories. But he knows what they're feeling, okay? 
And so he wants to speak to the sense of, well, this guy's rich and he's good, and we're never going to make it. They're making the comparison. We're never going to make it. We're, what are we going to do here? He's, he says, and, and they're, they're really unsettled. Like, how do we make it? That's what their question is. How do we make it? This is what he says. He says this. Let, 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 me, let me tell you a story. And he, here's the story. This is in the Gospel of Mark. But the story, the story goes like this. He says, once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a guy who owned a vineyard. And the, it was time for the grapes to be harvested. And you can't mess around with the grapes. They need to be harvested. Got to get them in. Got to get them in. Got to get them in. And so he, he didn't go on Indeed.com to find employees. You know, whatever internet possibilities we have now. That's not how he found. He didn't get any headhunters to try to f- recruit people. He did their version of Indeed.com, he went down to the local marketplace and he went down at 6 in the morning. This is what you did. You, you wanted to get daily workers. That's what you did. And he went down. He said, hey, any of you guys want, want some money? I'll give you a sil- There's a silver coin in it for you. One silver coin. It was a good wage. Fine wage for a day's work. That's fine. Silver coin in it for you. Come on, anybody want to work? 10, 15 guys. Yeah, we'll work. yeah I'll work. Yeah, sure, I'll work. And then they, they step up and they work hard in the vineyard all day long. Then he's still, he got to get rapes in. He's got as many people. So he comes back to the marketplace at, three, at 9 o'clock in the morning and says, hey, there's some people hanging around. Maybe they finished another job and they're back again. Or maybe they got up too late. Or maybe they had some thing going on in the world. He's come back at 9 o'clock. He says, hey, anybody here wanted a job? And yeah, there's a couple of people. Yeah, we'll take a job, one silver coin. Then he comes back at noon. Hey, anybody want a job? Yes. Hires them. Three o'clock. Comes back. Hires them. Five o'clock. Hires them. Six o'clock is quitting time. You know the story. What happens next? It's pay time. They didn't give a weekly wage or bi-weekly wage. It was like daily. Because everybody's living hand to mouth. So he says, okay, I'm going to give out the money. I'm going to pay you. So the guys that were, and he starts with those who were most recently hired. So all the guys hired at 5 o'clock, however many there were, he says, here you go, and he hands them one silver coin. Now, what's happening in the mind of the guys that were hand, uh, hired at 6 o'clock in the morning? They're seeing this and they're thinking, this is going to be sweet, right? Is, it, is that what you would think? This is going to be nice. Because they're getting a silver coin, they worked an hour. They're working an hour. This is going to be good. Then he calls the guys that were hired at 3 o'clock, they worked three hours, and he says, here, uh, and he gives them the silver coin. And then he calls the guys that were hired at 12. And then they worked six hours. He says, here, here's a silver coin. And then he approaches the guys who were hired at 9 o'clock in the morning. They worked nine hours. And he says, here's a silver coin. And then he goes and calls the guys that were hired at 6 in the morning and worked 12 full hours. And he says, here's your silver coin. And they say, what's up with this? Like, where's the justice here? And often when we hear this story, we think, hey, I don't really, and this is a story, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus about this one because I don't understand this story. It just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. You miss the understanding of what salvation is. What is salvation? What did Jesus say to the disciples in the previous passage of Scripture? What does Jesus expect of every one of us? He expects us to do what? To be all in. That's what he wants. And he wants a guy at 6 in the morning and 9 in the morning and, th- and 12 noon and 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock to be all in. And the issue is not how long you've been all in, but whether, you are n- whether or not you are all in. Now, you know that I accepted Jesus in my life at 5 years old. I've never really strayed away from the faith. I've never. I didn't do things that teenagers sometimes do to get into trouble. I didn't. I didn't get in trouble with alcohol or drugs or mess around. Yeah, I didn't do any of those things. I didn't do any of that. I am a pastor, and I've been a pastor for 40 years. And you know what? There's people, maybe in this room, maybe on the internet, maybe in one of the other services, maybe down at the Journey Cafe, there may be somebody looking at me and saying, like me, and putting me in, a, putting me in the same box as they might put you and say, wow. That person, Randy Bond, or this person, whoever you are, that person is rich and good. Like, so much better than me. And they look at their own life, and they say, look at the disaster I've made in my life. Do people ever think this way? Like, I have 
done this and that, and I made this mistake and that mistake, and I've cheated, I've committed adultery, and I've done this and that and the other thing. Man, I am so screwed up. Look at it, Randy. I don't have a chance. Does anybody ever feel that way? Have you ever felt that way before you really understood? Like, I don't, and like, I don't have a chance. So what's this story about? The story with the, the people hired. What, what is God saying? What was Jesus saying through that story in combination with what he, how he related to the rich man who was rich and good? What was he saying when he said to the rich man, hey, I want you to take everything you have and sell the money and then come and follow me. What was he saying to that guy? I want you to be all in. What was he saying to the disciples who were thinking, where do we stand right now? What's our spiritual destiny? What's he saying about their spiritual destiny? What's he really saying? He's saying it doesn't matter whether you've been hired at 6 a.m. I've been hired at 6 a.m. Do you understand that? I was hired by God at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. And then some other people, they're hired at 9 a.m. Maybe somebody here hired 9 a.m. You're 18 years old. You're a teenager. And you were hired, you were hired by God at 18 years old. And then some of us listening to me right now, you were hired at 12 noon. You're going through a divorce. You were 43 years old, and your world fell apart. And you were hired at 43. And then there's some people that are hired at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're 69. And there's just an emptiness. And they know they don't have it. And somebody near them, their spouse died, and they're saying, woo, that shook their world. And there's some people that are hired at five five o'clock in the afternoon. And they messed up for the fifth time with their drug use. And they're in prison. And they killed somebody. And they're on death row. And compared to me, who's worked since six o'clock in the morning, And they're on death row having done all the stuff that they've done, knowing the dysfunctionality of their own family system compared to mine, which was perfect, relatively speaking. What chance do they have? And the dysfunctionality of this child from this woman and this child from this woman. How do they stand a chance? How do they stand a chance? And maybe, maybe there's somebody here listening to me right now in this room or in one of the other services or on the internet at the, or at the Journey Cafe. Maybe there's somebody listening to me right now and saying, yeah, what chance do I have? What chance do you have? What did Jesus' story mean? He said, you can be hired at 6 a.m., you can be hired at 9, you can be hired at noon, you can be hired at 3, you can be hired at 5. Here's what I want you to do. When you are hired by God to serve him. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go all in. All in. All in. From this point on. But I haven't been all in. It doesn't matter. We're looking at this moment right here, right now, all in, this point forward. No matter where you are in life, no matter what you've done, all in, this point forward. So as I'm looking at this room right now, and anticipating speaking to the other groups, the, the other services and the internet crowd, you and the people at the Journey Cafe, because we'll take this service and capture it and pass it on to them or the other services. Where are you at? Where are you at? Now, here's what sometimes can happen. I was hired at 6 in the morning, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon has come. I've been working nine hours in the hot sun I've been picking grapes, and I picked up a basket. Ah! And my back hurts. See, sometimes problems happen in life. And from 3 to 6 o'clock, quitting time, ah! Like something happened to mess me up. And I'm... And sometimes, those of us who have been hired at 6 in the morning get disillusioned with God. And you know what? We were at one point all in, but we take some of these back. I'm not as all in as I was once was. If that's you, if that's you, you pulled some chips back, I'm, gonna chal- I'm challenging you right here, right now. And those of you listening to me, I challenge you right now today to decide, no matter what's happened in your life, what God is calling for you to do is go all in. Right now, today, 
to go all in with him. You know where you stand with God. You know where you stand. And there's no, con- now I'm raising my voice a little bit, that is not meant to communicate uh, judgment or criticism. It's representing challenge. It matters not what you've done, not that you've fallen off the wagon for Jesus. It doesn't matter. That's not the issue. Right now, today, the moment is for you to get all in with him. Are you all in with God right now? You have an answer in your mind. I'm challenging you. If the answer is no, no, I know truth, I'm challenging you. Come on now. Come on. Get back in the saddle. Or maybe there's somebody listening to me in this room or somebody listening to me in the internet or somebody's going to listen to me at Journey Cafe or somebody's going to listen to me in one of the other services. Maybe there's somebody listening to me right now that has never been in with God. And they, they've messed up and then they try. They really try. Yeah, Jesus mentioned these commandments. From here on in, I'm not going to commit adultery. And from here on in, I'm not going to kill anybody. From here on in, I'm not going to do these things. I'm not going to lie anymore. And then they, they fall off the wagon again. They fall off the wagon of intent. And they mess up again. Again. And, and now again. And now again. And I'm saying, you can't do it in your own effort. At some point, you need to fall on your knees before Jesus and say, Jesus... I don't know why you would, but I believe you love me. I believe you love me. And I know I've messed up. I've messed up big or I've messed up small, including me. But we've all messed up. We've all sinned. Every one of us needs to pray their confession of sins every week. Every one of us. Nobody's exempted from that. I know you love me and I know I've sinned and I know I can't make it on my own today. Lord Jesus, I've never done this before. Today, I open the door of my life to you. Come in, please, today. And from this point on, I'm going to be all in. By your power of your Holy Spirit, and we'll be all in. So I would like to invite you to pray. You know where you stand with God right now. That's not, I'm not calling out anybody. So you don't, there's no point to lying inside your head. There's no point to lying. You know where you're at, right? You know where you're at. No point to lying to yourself. God already knows what's going on inside your head. Have you drifted away from him and you're not at this moment all in? If you're not, let's make that right today. Or if somebody's, if I'm speaking to somebody and you've never invited Christ into your life and acknowledge that your salvation comes not from your good efforts but by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, you've never done that, pray and invite Christ into your life and go all in with him. You ready? You ready? This is why Jesus had these experiences and told these stories. This story was not about the rich man. And it actually wasn't about the disciples. It was about you. And the, and the, the workers that were hired at 6 and 9 and 12 and 3 and 5, that wasn't about those people. It's about you. Today's the day to go all in with Jesus. Let's pray together as we close. Lord God, I, I pray right now that you would be enabling people in this room and people listening to me to pray sincerely to you in their own way. For those who have never invited you into their life before, right now, Lord, help them to pray in their spirit. Lord, thank you for loving me. I have sinned. You know how. I am ashamed. But you've sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. Today I open my heart to you. Come in. And for all of us, all of us, whether we just prayed that prayer or whether we've been a Christian from six o'clock in the morning, Lord, hear us when we say, We want to be all in with you. All in. No holding back. 
that has something to say about how we use our money, then so be it. And that has something to say about how we use our time, then so be it. If, if being all in with you means responding and stepping out of our comfort zone, then so be it. We want to not just hear your word. We want to follow you. We want to be followers. We want to be all in with you. Help us. Help us. We fail so often, fall short so often. Help us to be all in with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn, which is whatever it is. I Surrender All. That's a good one. 579. Let's at this time express our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into Hades, the third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth in the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please be seated. Let's pray together, can we please? Lord God, uh, I pray that you would be with people that maybe have, will be making the decision, the challenge that I gave today. 
I pray that you would help them, whoever they are, to over the things of their past, to get beyond the disappointments that have caused them to shift away, or to get beyond the slop and the messiness of their lives that causes them sometimes to be very ashamed. Help them to experience in an unimaginable way your love, your overwhelming love. Help them to know that in spite of whatever they've done, in spite of the fact that they waited till five o'clock in the afternoon to follow you, that you love them as if they've been all in virtually their whole life. Just really minister to some people today or whenever people hear this message by the power of your Holy Spirit. And then I pray for people that have difficulties in their life. Betty Atkinson died. I did the funeral for Evelyn Sincero. Other people continue to grieve. But also there's people that have had life blow up in their faces. I can think of one person that's waiting for the possibility of a cancer report. And they're losing their mind. I pray for comfort for that individual and for others in the same boat. And I pray for people who in the past week have had overwhelming difficulties that they faced. Give them strength and hope. Strength and hope and direction as they try to navigate through some of that stuff in life. Just minister, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And thank you at the same time for all the blessings of life. All the blessings. We have two of our grandchildren with us and our son with us last night into today. Spend a little time, eat a lunch with them. And first thing Ben wanted to do was have a campfire. And we had a campfire at some moors. Thank you for the joy that comes to us in our lives. We all have elements of joy. We have challenge, we have elements of joy. That's mine. It's one of mine. We all have elements of joy. Thank you. Be with those who are struggling. Be with those who are just deciding. I want to go on with it, all in with you. And thank you for the many blessings. Thank you most of all for the presence of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his willingness to die on the cross for us in whatever state we've been so that we could become followers of yours and be transformed forever and one day come into your heavenly kingdom. Thank you for your love. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our concluding hymn, 489, Jesus Paid It All. 489, Jesus Paid It All.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.